individual parts of the church, we pledge to move towards this corporate reality so that the church can be a voice for the voiceless, a home for the wonderful, a respite for the weary, a balm for the dirty, God's presence in the world. running you know how it is here at our plant so i'm glad that we are you know that i am among a family that he loves me so doesn't matter if i'm running from all the way to over here so <laughs> um we want to welcome you if you're here for the first time or maybe for the fourth time or maybe you never fill out a connect card i want to invite you to do that there is a way to know you better to have a coffee with pastor rachel Pastor Ryan, and if you want a coffee with me, it needs to be a coffee and maybe a cookout, okay? I don't accept coffee only. <laughs> it needs to be longer than that. So, just letting you know. Uh, we have a couple of announcements, and you can see that on the back of your bulletin. And for the people that is online, we welcome you, and you're going to have a connect card there linked to the video. You can go to the comments, and you're going to see it there. And you're going to have the bulletin, digital bulletin as well, so you can see all the announcements. And probably when you get in today, you saw a big QR code at the door. That is a QR code that we spoke about last week. And once you go into that QR code, it's going to take you directly to a web page, our web page, that it has all the buttons that we need for worship service. You have the bulletin, you have the connect card, you has there the offering uh, button there. You have linked the Emily Dickinson book, digital, so you can click and you can see it whenever you are. I mean, if you want to read it sometime at work or something, you have it there, so you can get it from there as well. So you, if you want to explore that, um, that QR code, it's going to be fun. And also, it had, it's got, it had a, a button that it takes you directly to the YouTube uh, channel, which we have all the uh, worship services uploaded there as well. So in case if you want to just watch again another sermon or hear it again or share it with somebody, there is a way to do it. And I have um, an announcement that I want to share with you and that we are looking forward to accomplishing. This is for the cookbook. Many of you have heard about it, and we are so excited that we want to have it done and that we wanted to share all our uh, recipes. So if you have one, and if you want to share it with us and be part of this book, you can submit those recipes at cookbook at olumc.org. And you can get one of these little papers so they can remind you that um, the email. And Kathy has all those um, little reminders in the back so that way we can complete that and imagine knowing the recipe that Pastor Rachel loves which is your batch or your cake or you have like four uh, oh the room oh my god let me tell you my birthday was a few weeks ago and I received the best gift ever of one of them and it was a rum cake okay I got drunk before noon so <laughs> It's a really good recipe. So if you want to get that recipe, you need to be part of the book and you can get the book later, but we would love to have all the recipes that we can so we can have this book ready and we can share them. And it's a way to bring a little bit of Pastor Rachel, you know, kitchen into our kitchen as well. Or Pastor Ryan or Joni or, or Chuck. Do you cook? My wife. Ooh, you see? He's going to submit a recipe as well. So. There is a way. <laughs> so we welcome all of you. And it's so, so happy to have all of you here and the people online. So let us prepare our minds and hearts to worship today. The announcements are here. They're not going to go anywhere. So just take your time and you can read them again later. But for right now, let's take a deep breath. And then let's prepare.
morning. Good morning. Let me invite you to rise as you're able and join in the call to worship. You'll find the words on the screen and they're also on the front of your worship bulletin. Beloved, these are the days of holy fasting, a season for turning away from stagnation and despair, cynicism and fear, othering and distrust. So beloved, let us turn our hearts Godward, for there we will find generosity and light, wisdom and hope, poetry and wonder, love and new life. Let me invite you to remain standing as you are able as we join in our opening hymn, number 357, Just As I Am. We're going to be singing verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. Invite the kids to come on down for the kids' table with Denise. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Y'all moving really slow this morning. <laughs> Y'all walking like you got jobs. <laughs> I mean, come on, I'm gonna need y'all to pep up this morning. How you doing? Good? Yeah, it's spring break. Yeah? <laughs> I didn't think the parents would be more excited about spring break. Well, maybe those were teachers. Yeah. <laughs> morning I have a project that I need you all to help me with okay I am very very excited I've forgotten something okay I need a favor I need somebody to give me a shit that could wow thank you for that I was almost afraid that you know your boy shoes I'm just saying but you did good look at there so, this is what we're gonna do today, right? I want to plant some seeds that I have here. 
and I forgot my pot. So I'm gonna pour and plant some seeds in your shoe, that's okay. <laughs> today it talks about how Jesus got really upset when he came into the temple and people were buying and selling things in the temple and taking shortcuts through the church to get to where they needed to be because what's the church made for? Christ. Christ and to worship, right? And it's a, it's our, it was the temple at the time and that's what we use it for. That's the right thing. It's not, so Jesus got kind of mad you know what he did? He went in and turned over tables and threw things around. He made a, a whip and started chasing people out of the temple. And it's not about the building. It's not that we worship the building, but it's the representation of what the temple means. What do you think the temple stands for, or the church stands for? You said it a minute ago. Yes. It's how we worship Christ. The way we treat our building, the way we treat our bodies, you know, if you fill it with a lot of junk food, everybody hush. If you fill it with a lot of junk food, or if you don't take care of it, you don't exercise, are we really taking good care of the gift God gave us? No, so we have to take care of our bodies as a temple. We have to take care of the building that God gave us to worship in and to use it and respect it correctly, right? Jesus did not want us to misuse this building because it, and it also represents him because he knew that people were going to misuse and abuse him and he was given to us as a gift. So when we don't use the things in the correct way that Christ gave us, the things that represent him, then we're not taking care and represent, we're not worshiping Christ in the way he wants us to, right? So we have to take care of those things and those gifts that we've been blessed with, yeah? So do you take care of your bodies? <laughs> you exercise? You swim? That's good. And eat right? Yes. And, oh, oh. Yeah, I do chin-ups every time I sit up. And so, what, <laughs> Y'all make me giggle. So I want you to, and, and it's not just about taking care of your physical body, but you have to take care of your mental body. So you pray. That helps take care of you, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah. You eat healthy? I know you. So <laughs> you eat healthy? Okay. But it's about taking care of the things that God has given us, right? To worship. Okay, so I want you to remember that. That when we're here, we take care and respect this building that we're in. Thank you for that. You take care, and you take care of the, this building that we're in, right? Okay, so before we pray, I want to do something real quick, because, you know, I'm real big. I don't know if I wore this shirt last week, but I may wear it all month. Who run the world? That's all I'm saying. So, it's, women, it's, it's Women's History Month. And, you know, a lot of times when we acknowledge people that, um, do great things, we feel they have to be famous, and you know, that. I want to acknowledge some people who are here in our congregation. Sometimes we see people every week. So this is what I want you to do. Now, I'm gonna describe an occupation 
that one fabulous woman, I was gonna say badass, but my grandmother would roll over in her grave. She doesn't realize it's okay for me to say now. So I'm sorry, big mama. But there are some really badass women here. So I'm going to announce what one of them does, and I want you to look around and see if you can guess who it is. Now, if you know, don't say it. Let other folks who might not know say it, all right? Who would you think in our congregation is an investigator for like a thing, and we're not, because I'm gonna mess this up, um, for the law, for law enforcement, but I even think it's bigger than this, like the defense of, you know, it's some scary stuff. So, an investigator, so look around, who do you think that might, and if you know, don't say nothing. Anybody have any idea? Huh. Would you please tell us, badass woman, who you are? <laughs> Would you tell us what you do? Because I messed it up. I'm an investigator and a defense contractor. I investigate people who apply to work in law enforcement or for the federal government to make sure that they are suitable for the line of work that they have chosen. Yes. Yes. One more, and she didn't know I was gonna say this, so I just found this out today. So, we also have a PhD research scientist in our midst. I know you know us. <laughs> Anybody know who that is? Would you like to tell us who you are? <laughs> especially for Women's Month, to acknowledge and recognize the lives that women are not, because contrary to popular belief, we're still not just mothers and grandmothers and teachers, and, you know, which nothing, nothing wrong, because God love you teachers. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even know. I'm on, I'm on a mission to get every athlete in the country to adopt one school. That's my mission, but we'll talk later. But let's stand up and have a prayer. Can we please? I know you think I forgot about you. No, I don't know. I don't know. Stand up, please. Yes. Close your eyes. Dear Lord, I want you to repeat after me. Dear Lord, thank you for making me. Help me to remember that my body is a temple. And that we I should take care of that when I'm to, in order to worship you. To work, I know I messed that up. In order to worship you. Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I want to invite everybody to rise as you're able and pass a piece of Christ with one another today.
thank you. I love seeing everybody greet people up here. It's so much fun to watch. Y'all have no idea how wonderful y'all are. My name's Gretchen, and I want to talk to you for a moment this morning about generosity. Uh, we're doing a series during Lent, as you know, uh, about uh, the poetry of Emily Dickinson. And one of my favorite Emily Dickinson poems is one that begins with the line, I dwell in possibility. I dwell in possibility. And it reminds me that we can look at what is and imagine what could be. And if, it, if there is a place where people dwell in possibility, I think it's Oakland. We gather every week to worship and uh, to, to serve and pray together. And somehow when we gather, we know that God is making us a better, more Christ-like version of ourselves because God sees the possibilities in us. And for years now, we've had a scripture that we've really embraced at this church. Uh, you're probably familiar with it. It's uh, from Hebrews 13, and it says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So I want to tell you about an angel that I knew at Oakland a number of years ago. Her name was Jackie. She was a young woman who had made some unfortunate choices and had lost everything. Her job, her home, her marriage, her children. And in the midst of it all, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And in spite of every obstacle she was facing, she had this extraordinary faith that God was with her. Uh, she got a lot of support and encouragement at Oak Lawn, and we were able to help her get an apartment. Uh, several of us helped her move in. We stocked her refrigerator with groceries. Uh, she was able to get a job, and she was so excited to be able to work once more. So a couple of weeks after she started her job, she showed up early on a Sunday morning, and I was here, and she came up to me and handed me an envelope. Um, and it contained a check with what I recognized to be a substantial portion of what I think was her first paycheck. And I looked at her and I said, Jackie, you don't have to do this. Nobody expects you to give money to a church with all you're going through. And she looked a little insulted. And she said, but I need to give. And I realized that for Jackie, giving was much more than just obligation. It was a way of reclaiming her dignity and her sense of purpose. And it was a way of her declaring to us that she was not just a person who needed to receive, she was someone who had something important to give. Her giving was joyful. And her giving spoke to me of possibilities that I almost missed in her life. So I wondered many times afterward if Jackie was one of those angels that they talked about in that scripture that was sent to teach me something about generosity. Um, I'll never know. That's my story, however, and I am sticking to it. Because we dwell in possibilities here at Oak Lawn. So I want to invite you this morning to dwell in possibilities as well. Your financial giving keeps our doors open at night for support groups who are helping people who are struggling to break free from addiction. Just that act of being open and having a gathering place for people who are dealing with addiction in their lives has the possibility of transforming them. Your generosity makes it possible for us to provide shelter and clothing and warm meals for people on freezing nights. Your generosity makes possibilities possible. And your generation, our generosity, I'm sorry, makes you an angel as well. So join me in making possibilities happen at Oakland. Thank you so much.
first reading today is Emily Dickinson's poem, number 236, Some Keep the Sabbath Going to Church. Some keep the Sabbath going to church. I keep it staying at home, with a bottle ink for a chorister and an orchard for a gun. Some keep the Sabbath in supplies. I just wear my wings. So instead of toiling the bell for church, our little sexton sings. God preaches, a noted clergyman, and the sermon is never long. So instead of getting to heaven at last, I'm going all along. Our scripture reading today is John 2, 13 through 25. Or is it Mark? I've got both in here. Okay, it's John. Okay. <laughs> And then it says Mark, Jeffrey. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, listen for the word of God. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who were exchanging currency. He said to the dove sellers, Get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, Passion for your father, for your house, consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. While Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the miraculous signs that he had done. But Jesus didn't trust himself to them because he knew all people. He didn't need anyone to tell him about human nature, for he knew what human nature was. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm Pastor Rachel, and it's, uh, it's my joy to worship with you today. Um, welcome, if this is your first time here. Um, this is the season of Lent, and we're in the midst of a Lenten series focusing both on the poetry of Emily Dickinson, um, coupled with our scriptures for worship. The poem, in case you need to come back to reference it, is in the bulletin. Um, because I think there are some really beautiful ways that this poem can accompany us this week, as well as the spiritual practice that's listed there for us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Good and loving God, we give you thanks for this, your holy word. Open our minds and our hearts to receive your word in our lives today. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In each stanza of the poem that we have for today, I think Dickinson unleashes what seems to her maybe um, her idea of spiritualism. Uh, I think we live particularly in a culture right now that um, commonly talks about being maybe spiritual and not so much religious. I don't know if you've heard that, but I hear it frequently. Oh, I don't go to church. I'm, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Um, first, she deals with the concept of Sabbath and how she sits at home listening to a bird. And then comes the external vestments, the surplice, that are worn during worship. She doesn't think that these are essential for communicating with God. 
And I have to tell you, I agree with her on all points. <laughs> I agree these are not necessary for communicating with God. I agree I worship God when I hear the birds sing. And then in the last stanza of her poem, the most important section for decoding the overall idea of this poem, I believe, she looks at how God can be found in simple things as well as one's soul. Our meditation this week, if you're following along in our Emily Dickinson series, um, points out that Jesus is filled with fierce and righteous anger. Why? Because the temple has lost its way. It has become a crass, symbol of economic systems that aren't what the church is about. They're not what the temple was there for. And Jesus' love for the temple runs deep. And he doesn't want access to God's presence to be limited by finances. And at the same time, his actions provoke this question of where the real temple is, right? Does the sacred ground end at the sanctuary door? No. Or does it include nature and the world all around us, as Dickinson's poem suggests? Does the temple include Christ's own body? The church. Us. John, I think, uh, is such an interesting pairing with this poem, so I am grateful for this opportunity to look at the two together. Because John has something to say, and he doesn't mind messing with the standard story in order to say it. John, as in the fourth gospel um, in the New Testament, you may be familiar with the story of the cleansing of the temple, but if we pay attention, we will realize that he doesn't just give it his own distinct spin, but actually takes great license with the details and symbolism and even the chronology. And all for good reason. So let's start with the chronology. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus' cleansing of the temple comes much later in the story. Just after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the story actually plays a pivotal role as this like last straw um, that drives his opponents to conclude that the only way to deal with this upstart rabbi who is threatening the primacy of the temple and their precarious relationship with Rome is to do away with them. Right? In John, however, this story is right near the beginning. Coming immediately after the relatively small scale and more private sign of turning water into wine, at a celebration at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And in that act, he kind of goes public as an activist in this kind of activist performance art of turning water into wine, driving everything and everyone um, out of the temple in this act of cleansing the temple, overturning tables of money changers. It's dramatic. I mean, it's real, real dramatic. And it's even more dramatic in John. And then comes the symbolism part. In John's account, Jesus says, stop making God's house a marketplace. Calling into question the not simply expedient, but 
absolutely necessary act of changing coins in order to obey sacrificial law. These details lead to a very different story than Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell. John puts this story up front because it reveals something really crucial about who Jesus is. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the embodiment of grace upon grace. There is therefore no need for sacrifice. And that's what all the money changing was for. To buy the animals. Jesus incarnated, embodied grace suffices Fully, wholly, completely. So keep in mind, the temple had become a marketplace out of necessity. In order to buy animals for sacrifice, folks needed to change their Roman coins into Jewish ones and then purchase the animals. But with Jesus on the scene, the one who embodies abundance, Having just taken the waters of purification, also no longer needed, and turning them into wine, the wine of celebration, there is no need for changing money, for purchasing animals, for making sacrifice of this kind anymore, nor ever again. It may be that John is going so far as to say to a community living after the fall of the temple and who likely were expelled from their local synagogue that they do not need the temple at all. Why? Because Jesus' body, his physical incarnation, Life, death, resurrection, ascension, and gift of the Holy Spirit was sufficient and is sufficient to mediate God's grace and mercy. Jesus is the one who introduces us to the parental heart of God. That's huge. The one who makes the unknowable God actually knowable for us and approachable then and ever since then. In um, Celtic spirituality, there is um, something that is called, that, that is referred to as a thin place. A thin place is um, maybe sometimes referred to or identified as um, mountaintop experience or something in nature where you have this, this glorious spiritual experience. Um, but it's a place where you feel the, the beautiful um, natural setting combining with this finite um, material world and God's eternal presence and they and they come together in a way that you experience them all at the same time and it doesn't feel like there's any distinction between them and they call this a thin place and I've appreciated that phrase because um, I use it to describe those places where I can so clearly um, feel God's presence and power. But when I read John's testimony here, it occurs to me that really every place has the potential to be a thin place. Because God's presence in Jesus is set loose in the world. No longer um, confined to the temple. Or for that matter, the church. But always available to us. 
the body of Christ. The good news is that God is available to us 24-7. Absolutely anywhere we are. And that anywhere um, can be geographical or spiritual. In a church or at the club. At work or at school. Um, at a spiritual high point in our lives or something that feels like a desert. When we are with those that we love or when we're in places that feel desperately lonely in our times of joy, or in our times of sadness. When we're sinful and having fun, or when we're focused and holy. In all of these places, and more, God is present. Working always to comfort us, and heal us, and restore us, and draw us back into the heart of God. So you may be thinking, along with Emily Dickinson, why come on Sunday? If God is available and present to us everywhere. Maybe because the good news is so hard to remember amid the heartaches amid the tragedies of everyday life. One glance at the headlines and tragedies that we face in our single day um, makes it hard to believe sometimes that God is present, let alone cares. And so we come to church, not because it's the best or the only place to experience God, but because at church we can be reminded of God's presence and promise most clearly and easily, with intentionality, and with the strength of community and chosen family. We can look into one another's eyes and be reminded of God's presence because we see Christ in one another. In the beauty of the songs being sung and the words being spoken, um, we come and experience the sacraments through bread and wine and water. We hear clearly the bold proclamation and promise that God is with us and for us. And that experience equips us and encourages us to look for and partner with God's presence. Everywhere we go, in all the places we find ourselves during the week. Our call is not to draw people to church because this is the place that you see God. Our call is to invite other people to come and join us in this place because when you come here, you might be reminded of God's presence and power in your life that will accompany you and strengthen you as you go from this place so that this one hour might fill you and sustain you the other 167 hours of the week. And then we rinse and repeat over and over and over again. Does the sacred ground end at the sanctuary door? Of course not. Of course not. But I'm preaching to the choir today because you know that. Along with Dickinson, may we, Christ's body, the church, experience the sacred in nature and in the world around us everywhere we go. As we come to the table today 
I invite you to be reminded that this is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the gift of God's love and forgiveness is present at this table, and there is a seat for you at the table. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up on an ark the waters saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain, he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, 
He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, shared it with his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. For this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you eat this bread and drink from this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever.
Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go forth in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you at this time to uh, rise as you are able and join us in singing our closing hymn today, which is How Great Thou Art.
place today, I want to offer first just one invitation. Um, there are so many places that your soul might sing in the world this week, and I hope that you worship God in all of them, in all the places and all the ways that you experience and encounter God in the world. Um, one of those places might be today at 3 o'clock, there's going to be a concert of the New Symphony Orchestra, and our very own Lexi will be playing cello. And I believe she's got some extra tickets for free if you're interested. Uh, find your, they're all free. You can all go. It's at 3 o'clock at the Moody Performing Arts Center um, in the Arts Center downtown. Correct? And what? And Denise is singing. It's, you get two of our very own in one concert. So um, go enjoy the music um, at the Moody Performing Arts Center today and let your heart be filled. Um, listen to the birds. Listen to the world around you and all that God is doing in nature, that all that God is doing in the people that surround you. Today and every day, be reminded that God's presence is not just in this room. You don't come here to find God. You come here to be reminded of God's abundant love for you and the whole world so that maybe you will be strengthened and healed and restored to go out into the world and share God's love with abundance. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son 